we wind up the Skype conversation and move directly to the next speaker. Hi, Claire. Hi, Tony. How are you doing? Work here in the little dark. Let me, on behalf of all the Malaysians who are seated here and who are watching on Uba TV and all other live streaming devices, as well as all Malaysians in this country, thank you for all the effort you have done to support we can't thank you enough. Thank you very much. Um, we can't pay you. <laughs> Maybe we get some money back from Joe Lo. That might help. <laughs> but certainly we look forward well, to... Certainly we look forward to more exposés from you on Jolo, on ABBA, on One MDB and all other shenanigans that Barisan National have committed their crimes against the people of Malaysia. Thank you so much. Or henchman 
Sigilin and Tiffany here. On the 9th, Sigilin wrote back to Petro Mahoney, uh, Patrick Mahoney. Jolo has spoken to the top boss. Do you know who this top boss is? Target to close a deal by 20th of September where all agreements are signed and monies can be paid to Petro Saudi before the end of September. Tenth of September. Again, Jolo to Patrick Mahoney. We need to move fast. We want to sign and pay by September 09. 15th of September, so there were emails in between. Come 15th of September, they were sharing a series of emails, sharing the storyline for conference call with 1MDP. Which means, up to 15th of September, 1MDP got no idea what the hell is happening. These people were choreographing. Now, we tell 1MDP this, say that Najib already met with Prince Turkey, got the endorsement from the uh, uh, King Abdullah of uh, Saudi Arabia, and then present it in such a way, da da da, such that 1MDB would be more convinced that da da da. This was an email conversation in an email on the 15th of September. Come 18th of September, Jolo wrote an email to Dato Sharul Haomi, CEO of 1MDB, introducing for the first time Tariq Obay. <coughs> Hi Tariq, Sharul, I'm putting the both of you together. First time, 18th of September. And then on the same day, before anything was even discussed between 1MDB and Petro Saudi officially, Petro Saudi took the initiative to set up a subsidiary, wholly owned subsidiary by the name of 1MDB Petro Saudi Limited. Already set up, okay, I prepared this. It's called 1MDB Petro Saudi Limited, 100% owned by Petro Saudi. 20th of September, Dato Sharul Haomi wrote to Jolo and Tarek Mubai. Thanks, Joe. Dear Tarek, pleased to make your acquaintance. Looking forward to meeting face to face next week. Okay? And they met. No, they haven't met. <laughs> On the 21st, Sid Lilin wrote to Petro, Patrick Mahoney. He said, Joe has softened the ground. So the 1MDB people are expected to come here, meet, chat to know each other, and sign. Jolo counting. And then, Tiffany here, who is the legal advisor for Jolo's team, sent a draft JV agreement to Patrick Mahoney to be used for the JV between Petro Saudi and 1MDB. 23rd, 1MDB team meets Petro Saudi International for the first time in London. 25th, Petro Saudi International signs a 700 million US dollar loan agreement with the wholly owned subsidiary 1MDB Petro Saudi International Art Limited as well as injecting 1.5 billion of so-called assets into the subsidiary. Know that this is before the JV has been set up, signed. They already signed an advanced law agreement. So straight away the subsidiary, empty shell, or the parent, 700 million US dollars. Okay? This is on the 25th of September. Come 28th, of September, Petro Saudi International signs the, signed the JV agreement with 1MDB. 1MDB injects 1 billion US dollars into 1MDB for 40% share. 
Okay, so Petro Saudi 1.5 billion assets gets 60%, 1 MDB 1 billion dollars cash gets 40%. But there is of course the 700 million US dollar loan that's already in the MT subsidiary. And on the 29th, Petro Saudi International sends a letter to the, the, the joint venture requesting for the repayment of the 700 million US dollars. Debt. To be repaid to Petro Saudi Limited, they gave an account number, and upon tracking that account number, thanks to the good work of Sarawak Report, it is paid to Good Star Limited. And on the 30th of September, the subsidiary, the joint venture company, paid the 700 million US dollar account of uh, uh, funds to Good Star Limited, authorized in full knowledge by Dato Sharon Hong. And on the very same day, Good Star signed a broker agreement okay, with Tarek Obay to pay 85 million US dollars as broker fees. <laughs> For the front. This is the one month miracle of 1MDB Petrosol. Multi billion ringgit transaction. Snap. I tell you, I went to the wrong school. I should have gone to water. <laughs>
But very few energy was looking for money. They don't have enough money to explore. So they signed an agreement with Petro Saudi in 4th of July, 2008. This is called, sorry, this should be 4th of July, 2009. Okay? This is called a farm-in agreement. So I got the rights to the field. I don't have money. I find someone to give the money, finance the exploration, and they get rights to get 50% of the returns. So that's a technical term called farm-in agreement. So Petro Saudi has to fund the exploration and receive 50% or have rights to receive 50% of the returns. Now, come 25th September, uh, two months, three months later, okay, PSI injects assets into 1MDB Petro Saudi, claims that it is worth 2.7 billion for 1.5 billion of shares. So generous. This thing's 2.7 billion only. Oh, you know not, I only ask for 1.5 billion in shares. Good deal for 1MDB. Except, come the 28th of September, after the agreement, joint venture agreement has been signed, on the 24th of November, Petro Saudi terminated the farming agreement. <laughs> so there's nothing left in 1MDB Petro Saudi. 1MDB injected 1 billion US dollars into the company in the hope of being able to explore this oil reserve somewhere in Caspian Sea that allegedly belongs to Petro Saudi. It doesn't matter that 700 million has been taken away. If the oil well is very profitable, maybe we'll get to cover all of it back, except there's no more agreement even to jointly explore the Sudar fields in Caspian Sea. How else can you describe it other than calling it the mother of the mother of the mother of all hey, scandals in Malaysia? <laughs> but there's a problem. One MDB management is fully aware of this. You can say that before you sign the JV agreement, what happened between Jolo and Petro Saudi? I anything also don't know. I blur so long. You can say lah, okay? But after the JV has been signed and you play a role within the JV company, you can no longer claim ignorance over the fact that you just lost 2.7 billion of so-called assets in one MDB petrol something. They have to know about it. They cannot do know. So what do they have to do next? This is a big hole, you know. How do you report it in your annual accounts? Try it out. How will it show up in the annual accounts? How do we keep it from people like Tony Pua? <laughs> All are okay. So this is the first cover-up. Come 31st of March 2010. In the audited accounts, of 1MDB, March 2010, Financial Report, page 23. Written here, it talked about the JV, which was signed on the 28th of September 2008. Um, da -da 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 -da. But subsequently, last paragraph, on the 31st of March, very last day of the financial accounts, those who do accounts, year end 31st of March, you know that the last day is 31st of March, 2010. On the very last day of the 31st of March 2010 accounts, the company entered into a share sale letter agreement to dispose of its investment in the joint venture company for a consideration of, of 1.2 billion US dollars. The consideration is payable to the company through the creation of indebtedness in favor of the company via an issuance of notes receivable. This is basically accounting mambo jumbo. What it basically says is this. What it says is the company now okay, decided that ayah, this joint venture is not working out. And this was admitted by Tan Sri Lok Kamaruddin, who is the chairman of 1MDB today. Cannot work the joint venture. So we decided that we want to exit the joint venture, which is okay. You make money in some places, you lose money in some places, those places you lose money, you cut losses. You exit your investment. Okay? So fine, they sold their investment. The problem with this 
is after they sold their investment, they didn't take back the money, they gave the money back to Petro Saudi as a loan. If you don't believe in the business anymore, why do you still lend them 1.2 billion US dollars? No, as an equity holder, you get a say in what happens to the money. As a lender, you get no say in what happens to the money. And after knowing what has happened over the last six months, why is it that you are now lending money to PetroSaudi on the basis of a corporate guarantee from PetroSaudi, which we know have nothing. 1.2, so 1MDB becomes an international alone. <laughs> we export our competitive advantage. <laughs> And what was more mysterious that Claire found was they found emails discussing the conversion to a loan. It's called a Murabaha loan or Murabaha notes, Islamic loan. Okay? They found an email discussing all the nature of the Murabaha agreements on 4th of May 2010. This is from Patrick Mahoney to Project Uganda. Project Uganda are the team handling the UBG transaction, which I'll talk about later. So there were three agreements attached. They were discussing it with the loan agreement, letter of guarantee, letter of agreement between Petro Saudi and one MD. And in another document exposed by the Sarah report, which is the notice of drawing down when they wanted more money, it referred specifically to the Murabaha financing agreement dated 14th of June, 2011. Now, where's the problem in this? The problem in this is that the accounts say the transaction took place on the 31st of March, 2010. But the agreement is signed on the 14th of June, 2010. Now, who were the auditors then? The first auditors for 1MDB gave up, resigned even before completing the first set of accounts for 31st of March 2010. Ernst and Young, EY. KPMG took over and they signed off the accounts saying that the joint venture was converted into a loan on the 31st of March when in actual fact the agreement only took place after and in my view, as an afterthought to cover up the hanky-panky within the joint venture agreement. And basically, KPMG played its role to abet 1MDB in covering it up. I don't know whether there are any KPMG auditors here, but what I'll say, KPMG as a firm will fail Malaysians. It is because of cover-ups like this, 1MD was allowed to continue to live on and continue to accumulate more debts until what it has today when we couldn't take it anymore. Let us all welcome Rafizi Ramli. <laughs>
name. Now, now that the cover up is sorted, okay, one MDB can continue with his business. What did it do? It gave Petro Saudi additional loans. <laughs> now that I've given one point two billion, I got away with it. The next one I give another five hundred million US dollars, and then another two hundred million, and then another one. 130 million for a total of 2 billion US dollars or approximately 6.2 billion ringgit then in fact more today to 1 billion US dollars sorry it should be 7.2 is it 7.2? yes 7.2 uh, billion ringgit today my math's not very good that's why I cannot compete with Bruno ok 7.2 billion ringgit Okay. Now, what did this loan do? No, you give more money to Petro Saudi, where did this money go? And again, thanks to documents exposed by the Saura report, let me give you the story okay, in a chart form that is easy to understand. That was what everyone asked me to do. Please make it easy to understand. Okay, so this summarizes what has happened to all this money that went to Petro Saudi. One MDB paid 1 billion for 40% stake in 1MDB Petro Saudi, which then paid 700 million US dollars to Good Star Limited, which belongs to Jolo and Associates, followed by the conversion to a loan where 1MDB Petro Saudi became a 100% subsidiary of Petro Saudi International Caymans. Okay? And then the second loan came about after everything is cleared. On the 8th of September 2010, they extended another 500 million loan to 1MDB Petro Saudi, which is now not a subsidiary, of which 160 million went to Good Star again. US dollars, huh? US dollars, huh? You need to multiply 3.7 now. Okay? And from the 340 million that went to Petro Saudi, 260 million was shifted to Petro Saudi International. Note the difference this time, it is Sicilis or some tell me Seychelles. <laughs> Seychelles. Say it with me, Seychelles. <laughs> so it goes to Petro Saudi Seychelles. But from documents again exposed by Saura report, Seychelles. Although nominally is the subsidiary of Petro Saudi Caymans, it's in effect a front or an entity wholly in control by Jolo and Associates. Okay? And via Seychelles, Petro Saudi, the subsidiary Javis, Javis and Rembrahat, executed uh, acquisition of UBG Brahat in Malaysia, 1.4 or 1.5 million acquisition in 29th of September 2010, of which 465 million went to Tun Thai Mahmud and family, who owns 37.2% of UBG. But better still, 52% is owned by Abu Dhabi Kuwait Malaysia Investment Corporation of which Jolo has a stake. So he took money from 1MTB, pretend it's foreign direct investment, come into Malaysia, buy Malaysian companies, issue press release. We are so confident in the Malaysian economy, the Middle East will bring in money, it invests in all these great companies of Malaysia, when in fact it's Jolo turning the money in circles and circles back to his own pocket. This is Money Laundering 101. <laughs> that must be what they teach them in modern business school. Uh. <laughs> now all the kids want to go water ready. <laughs> um, and, and, and basically the money went in circles like that. Okay? One MDB. Innocent, plain stupid, or complicit. We have to ask the CEO of 1MDB then, Datuk Sharul Hangmi. 
why you pay US 700 million to Good Star Limited? There was a series of questions posed by The Age last week. Read those questions. They are all valid questions in The Age. Tato Sharon Haumi must answer. Was he just stupid? Was he complicit? Or did he receive instructions from the above to approve all transactions? Okay, those are the things that we hope to find out from the Auditor General Investigations. And then, where is Dato' Bakir Saleh? Okay, how come Dato' Bakir is involved? He was the first chairman of 1MDB. And he quit in December 2009. Why did he quit? Maybe he couldn't take the nonsense inside. He would have a story to tell. And we would be very interested to hear from Dato Bakay And this man here, Where is this money? 
So we have been pursuing these payments money for a while. Okay, finally, tak boleh tahan. Whether under pressure from auditors or whatever, we don't know. Note that accounts for this year was also late. It's supposed to be due on 31st of March 2014. Okay, 2014. But first of August, finally, they, they because they couldn't complete the accounts, the first of August, they finally had the board of director authorizing the redemption of the investments in Cayman Islands. Okay? November 14, they claim that half of it, 1.22 billion, has been redeemed. The proceeds already used, substantially utilized to pay debt interest, other options, working capital, and the balance written in accounts promised by end of November 2014, last year. So the balance of 1.1 billion. Okay? So with that promise, the auditors sign off the accounts on the 5th of November. 5th of November uh, 2014. Okay, they signed the report. And after a lot of pressure, because on the 5th of November they signed the report, on the 30th of November they failed to pay a 2 billion loan. Now, those who are in business knows that audited accounts give you a picture of whether this company can be a continued going concern. If there are problems or questions as to this company, whether they can go, they can be a going concern, the auditors will qualify the audited accounts. The auditors passed the accounts on the 5th of November 2014, fine colours, zero qualifications. By the end of the same month, no money to pay $2 billion. What were the auditors doing? Seriously, what were the auditors doing? How can they not have expected a liquidity crisis in one MDB within a month after they signed off the accounts? I can understand if there's some chuck club ABC auditor. <laughs> this is Deloitte Malaysia, who were paid 2 million ringgit in fees a year for the audit. And they can do this. Within a month after signing up accounts, one MDB cannot pay his debt. Okay? Finally, they redeem. They call it, they redeem the debt. Uh, they redeem the investment, the last week on 13th of January. But still cannot pay debt because they say money cannot bring back. 1.1 billion US dollars is about 4 billion ringgit. They had a 2 billion ringgit loan, they say cannot bring back. Okay? And finally, the 2 billion was paid in the middle of February, just before it became default. Okay. Was it a loan from Tan Sri and Krishnan? Was it paid by 1MDB? Was it assisted by MOF? We do not know. What we know is that 1MDB has to receive another injection of about 1 billion ringgit just only 3 weeks ago in order to keep it alive, to pay interest. So the question is where did all this money go? The auditors must explain. And right at this very moment, Deloitte would be auditing 1MDB's books now. The year end is 31st of March 2015. They would have started the audit and these are questions they must answer in this year's financial statements. There cannot be any more excuses in not qualifying the accounts of 1MDB. Okay, those are the things you have read in the papers. A lot of people know about, but there are more. The problem we have is there are more. There's this company called 1MDB Global Investments Limited, wholly on subsidiary of 1MDB. They took a 3 billion US dollar loan on 19 of March 2013. The purpose of this bond, well, when they raised the bond, there was controversy because they paid 9.4% in certain commissions, fees, and expenses. Normally, a company 100% owned by a government, any government should not pay more than 1%. They paid 9.4%. Okay? Bigger than how long? Okay? The proceeds of which, by, I don't talk about government because I've talked about it in my previous forum. Okay? The proceeds of these funds will either let online all of the net proceeds of this offering to Abu Dhabi Malaysia Investment 
company limited ADMIC or use the net proceeds of the following uh, offering to fund investments in ADMIC which will be a 50-50 joint venture between uh, the 1MDB Global Investments and ABBA Investments and Investment Arm of Emirate of Abu Dhabi. In the meantime, we have problems with BLW 8826 and WVN 2479, uh, which is uh, obstructing traffic as at this point in time. Sorry, I have to miss, miss the exciting part. Move your car first. The problem is, they say they want to form this joint venture to invest together with uh, Abu Dhabi, okay, ADMIC. As of last year, when they reported their financial statements, and as of today, I believe, while the terms and scope of the proposed joint venture, after more than a year, no, okay, are being finalized, a portion of the proceeds from the private debt securities amounting to 1.56 billion US dollars have been placed in various investment portfolios under custody, again, of a licensed financial institution with good credit rating. 1.56 billion is approximately 5 billion ringgit. More than 5 billion ringgit. Okay. And again, in the Deloitte audited financial statement, this 5 billion plus ringgit is classified as a level 3 asset. Okay. We don't know where the money is. It's not just the Cayman's money that's missing. This money that was raised under 1MDB Global Investments was also missing. And even though the proceeds from the bond issuance were supposed to have gone into the joint venture, half of it, 1.4 billion or so, have already been used as booking capital and debt repayment purposes in the parent company, 1MDB. So basically, they raised the bond. Nothing, not a single cent of the bond was used for the purposes that they have specified in the prospectus document. They've been used internally, burnt, or half of it invested in something that we God knows what it is. And who are these other investments that keep popping up in Malaysia? No? Claire was talking about other investments just now. She didn't have pictures to show. Go to Sarawak Report, the headline story now has lots of pictures, exciting ones. You have this type of pictures where the Kadim al Baishi. Chairman of ABBA Investments and Managing Director of International Petroleum Investment Corporation Abu Dhabi signing various agreements with the Malaysian government, many of which never happened. And then you have got pictures like this, where he's partying in some club in Las Vegas. I have to censor that portion. This is uh, our Arab friend eh? from Abu Dhabi. Eh? Ah, this one even better. He's our Arab friend with our Malaysian friend. On 25th of May, 
1MDB acquired Tanjong Energy Holdings from Ananda Krishna for 8.5 billion ringgit. They took a loan of 6.7 billion ringgit and an additional bond of US dollars 1.75 billion. On 22nd of October, they took over Genting Sanyin for 2.38 billion ringgit. They took a loan of 700 million and a 1.75 billion US dollar bond. bond. On 21st of June 2013, they took over Jima Ventures in the Greece Milan for 1.23 billion ringgit and they took a loan of 600 million, the rest financed by internal funds. Total acquisition value 12.11 billion and they took a loan of 8 billion ringgit plus 3.5 billion US dollars. Immediately, the auditors, after looking at this acquisition, said you paid too much, they knocked off. 1.2 billion ringgit, leaving a net value of 10.9 billion. And the total loans taken to finance a 10.9 billion acquisition, 20.9 billion. You borrow 21 billion dollars to buy 11 billion. Where did the rest of the 10 billion go? They pay all the certain commissions and fees and uh, expenses for Goldman Sachs. Huh? They issued the bonds at a discount, they lost money there. They obtained a guarantee from International Petroleum Investment Corporation, the guy you saw just now, okay, and paid him a big fee. And so, with the power plants worth approximately 11 billion ringgit, even after you add all the new contracts the government gave them, they extended the contracts for Tanjo, they extended the contracts for Genting Sanyin. They gave them a new Project 3B power plant in Negeri Sembilan. They gave them a new solar power plant in Kedah. They gave them another gas turbine power plant in Malacca. And perhaps more to come. The H estimated that the valuation for the IPO, the whole value of the company was only 12 billion ringgit. After adding all this, only less than 12 billion ringgit. Even if you sell 80% as what the minister said, I will sell 80% of the stock to raise money to pay off that. 80% of 12 billion is only 9.6 billion ringgit. You have got a 21 billion gaping hole. You sell 80% of your most profitable assets. There's nothing else that's making money in one MDB except these power companies. They sell 80% of their most profitable assets and they expect to be able to cover up all the other holes in one MDB. Okay? This is where half of one MDB's loans come from. Then they say, oh, don't worry. When I ask that question in parliament, how do you fill up the rest of the hole? They say, don't worry. After we sell 80% of one MDB, okay, we will also realize the value of all our property. So you can see here the property is like a Tun Raza exchange. Go there now, flat piece of land. Okay? Bandar Malaysia, some members in airport, go there now, the airport's still there. Nothing has happened. Okay? And they bought TRX from the government for 194 million. It has been revalued to 2.3 billion. They bought one the Bandar Malaysia from the government at 1.7 billion. It has been revalued to 3.5 billion. When they buy from the government, they get a 90%, well, 50% to 90% discount. But when they buy from private businessmen in Penang, they paid over the top 1.268 billion for a piece of land that cannot be developed in Penang. <laughs> just before the last general election, just so that Najib can go to Penang and promise Penangites, we will build affordable housing for you. Until today, uh, in Hokkien they say in Penang, uh, Bidu <laughs> boy. Smell also. So they paid 3.13 billion and it is now already revalued extensively to more than 7 billion ringgit. Even if you sell it at the inflated value, at another 3 billion, you sell it 10 billion. 10 billion here, 10 billion in, uh, in, in, in the power play, 20 billion, you got 42 billion of that. Where will the rest of your money come from? GST. GST. <laughs> Good politician. <laughs> so the question is, can 
what can we be, be rescued? Oh. Is it better to give them bailout funds, hope that they revive themselves, or just cut it loose and let whichever idiot that lend them money suffer? Yeah. Should government take money from the taxpayers? No. Or should no. they can instead of throwing good money after that. I think the question based on this, the answer <laughs> is very obvious. Uh, I won't touch on the next two slides more because I'm sure my colleague Rafizi will touch on this, otherwise he'll say I took all his points. <laughs> it is not the only scandal. There is SRC International, one of Rafizi's favorite topic, 4 billion. And there's Pembina and PFI, 47 billion. This one is my other colleague's topic, not the own gaming. Be prepared for another forum, this size. Okay, I've spoken a lot. Uh, I want to give room now and time to my colleague Rafizi to share his thoughts. Thank you so much.